Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Michelangelo stage. Our next speakers are Jonathan Lax and Ben Simmons, 3D artists and directors of Geek Animation, who are going to speak about Blender and the graphic design software. Thanks very much. Uh, morning. Uh, my name is Ben Simmons. This is Jonathan Lax, like she said. Um, and I thought I'd start by showing you a bit of what Blender can do with uh, the Blender demo reel. So I thought we'd do that. So that was a bit of what Blender can do. And uh, we're going to talk to you today about some of Blender's features. Jonathan's going to talk about various different aspects of Blender and things you can use it to make. And I'm going to talk about uh, Blender's modeling features. So I'm going to start by saying, uh, yeah, we're Gecko Animation. We, uh, we do um, visual effects for TV, uh, advertising, things like that. We also do some still images. And uh, we use Blender for about 90% of our work. And Jonathan's going to talk about some of the reasons we do that. So I'm going to pass it over to him. Hi, my name is Jonathan Lax. Uh, I started using Blender in about 2002. And uh, back at university, I ran a few workshops trying to get kids involved in 3D animation. And Blender was the perfect tool for that. And in 2007, I formed Gecko Animation. And uh, we do computer animation graphics uh, for TV commercials. Uh, TV shows like Red Dwarf and uh, for product visualization and other such stuff. And uh, Ben uh, joined us a couple of years ago and uh, he also has produced a series of uh, tutorials and online learning material using Blender and has also produced a book, uh, Blender Masterclass, uh, which is on sale at the moment. And uh, yeah, it's been not bad. So uh, why, why do we use Blender? Uh, well, first of all, it's free. Uh, if you go to blender.org, there is a download of the latest version. And uh, you can also participate in the development of Blender. Uh, there are test builds and uh, new development builds are freely available. I think there is a daily build uh, produced uh, for all operating systems uh, that you can uh, go in and you can either bug test or you can just try and play with all, all the sort of new features. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it moves along very, very quickly. Uh, sorry, actually. Uh, it's also very flexible. Uh, Blender has, uh, because it's such a large program in terms of all the wealth of different things that you can do, uh, if you try and keep all of your work within Blender, you can actually go back and forth between different type, different areas of your production very, very easily. So it makes it very flexible in terms of uh, if your client wants, comes to you and says, hey, I really need to change a fundamental aspect of your project. Uh, normally, you'd have to completely dump all of your work and then start from the beginning in the first program that you started with. Uh, but in Blender, you can just go straight back to earlier stages of the production, go to different parts of your uh, workflow, and then start up again, and uh, it's much easier and quicker. Uh, also, uh, it's very lightweight. Uh, Blender has, uh, I think the download from Blender.org clocks in at about 70 megabytes, 60 to 70 megabytes. And it also has very, very low system requirements. Uh, I think it's only limited to how much, how complex your work is going to be. And uh, so, oops, sorry. Uh, 
uh, extensible. Uh, so it, but Blender is uh, built on, uh, it's, it's fully compatible with uh, Python scripting. Um, Python, if you know a little bit of Python, you can build add-ons, uh, you can customize your UI, and you can also uh, fully automate your workflow uh, all through Blender and uh, Python. And it's uh, open source, 100% uh, open source. Uh, Blender is f uh, developed by a community of really passionate uh, developers online. And uh, it actually has one of the fastest release cycles of any software that I know. Every two months, a new version is released with brand new features and uh, brand new uh, ways of doing work. And that, uh, only in the last couple of years, it's suddenly become uh, a huge, incredible uh, piece of software, uh, all based around open source technology. And so it's a great, great piece of software for people like us who run a small studio uh, because of all of these reasons. Now, so what can you do in Blender? Uh, online at uh, blenderartists.org, you'll find a whole wealth of uh, loads of still images, loads of artwork uh, that uh, people have been producing. Uh, as a fundamental uh, base for Blender when it started out, it started out as an animation suite. And you can do modeling, texturing, animation. And uh, you can use one of two uh, different render engines that Blender is built in. Uh, one is a scanline renderer called Blender Internal, uh, which is similar to Maya's Mental Ray, if you know Maya. Uh, and then there's Cycles, which is a unbiased renderer engine based on ray trace technology. It's similar to Octane, uh, Indigo. And uh, that also in, uh, is also compatible with uh, CUDA and uh, OpenCL. So if you can use graphics card, uh, so if you have a fast graphics machine, then uh, you can really push the boundaries of what you can do uh, with rendering. Uh, so recently with uh, Blender in the last couple of years, uh, certainly how we've been using it is uh, for visual effects. Blender's uh, visual effects pipeline, uh, you can now uh, do keying, uh, rotoscoping, uh, had a whole load of simulation effects. Uh, from liquids to uh, smoke and fire. And it's also surrounded around a new development, which is the camera tracker. Uh, Blender's camera tracking tools are fantastic now, and uh, they're being improved all the time. And uh, we used to use uh, Synthize. I don't know whether any of you used Synthize before. And uh, we've now completely 100% switched over to Blender's camera tracker. And uh, it's been very successful on that front. Uh, in video games, ga Blender has an inbuilt game uh, engine uh, that is logic based and it's also fully compatible with Unity. So any of you game developers out there, uh, you can, uh, Unity can open any of Blender's files. So you can do all your animation, all your modeling and uh, create all your characters that you want for your game in Blender and then immediately bring them into Unity and they're already up and running and ready to go. This is an, uh, one game, Eat Sheep, that's on iOS and Android as one example of a game built in Blender. And uh, you can also do vector graphics uh, in Blender. There's also, if you look at the 3D view uh, and look at, if you look at it face on in an orthographic view, you can draw curves and uh, use, create vector graphics that way much uh, pretty well. And uh, there, there have been several uh, open movie projects that you may have heard about uh, created in Blender. The Blender Foundation uh, uses these projects to further the development of Blender. And all of these short films were both uh, composited and edited in Blender as well. So uh, all color grading and uh, editing of the, these films uh, all staying straight within Blender. So you can go from modeling, animation, rendering, and immediately come straight into the compositor and also output a clip straight in one, using just one button and go all the way. Now, uh, recently, you can't really get away in the, from the news uh, in, for uh, 3D printing, um, which has just been all over the place at the moment. And uh, the, uh, Blender has a set of add-ons uh, that can give you a whole range of tools to produce really great 3D prints. This is an example of one that we have in the office of uh, the spider that you saw right at the beginning. It was on, Blen on uh, Ben's book. And uh, we, that was printed first time, no problems at all. And uh, the reason for that was uh, the tools that we have uh, in Blender for um, uh, calculating volume, uh, hollowing out your models uh, to save uh, on price for, for the um, materials that you're printing in, and uh, also for error checking and uh, creating fully manifold objects that you need for 3D printing. It's all there in Blender. Now, it all starts with modeling. 
and uh, Ben is going to talk to you at length about uh, modeling and how to create stuff in Blender because most projects, whether you're developing games, doing visual effects or 3D animation, it starts with modeling and uh, he'd like to get you uh, guys producing some models in a workshop that we have later on today. And so Ben's going to introduce all that. Thanks very much. So yeah, we've, uh, we've seen some of the things you can do with Blender, but basically whatever you want to make, it probably is going to start with a model. So I'm going to talk about a bit about Blender's different modeling tools, some ones that have been around for a long time, some that are really new and interesting as well. So um, the type of model that you are going to make depends on what you want to use it for. It's pretty obvious. If you want a game model, it's going to have to be made up of triangles, it's going to be low poly, if it's going to be on a mobile device or something like that. Um, but that goes out the window if you want to do a still render, maybe. Um, here, your poly count can go into the millions, maybe even into the tens of millions, something like that. Blender's capable of handling that. Uh, your topology, I'll cover what topology is in a second if you haven't heard of the term before. But that could be crazy. You can have triangles and quads all over the place. It doesn't matter what your model looks like under the hood, as long as it looks nice in that final render. Animation is different again. You need to make a model that uh, subdivides well, that deforms well when you try and animate it. And Blender's got tools for making models that work well when animated, and it's also got a wealth of animation and rigging tools. Um, and Jonathan just mentioned 3D printing as well. Uh, it's a new, really new addition to Blender and something that's becoming more and more interesting. Uh, Blender has a lot of tools for checking that your model will 3D print well, things like checking for overhang, checking for wall thickness, and for calculating volume. So I'll cover a bit about those too. Uh, as I said, I mentioned the word topology. If you haven't heard of it before, don't worry about it too much. But what it is, it's, it's the way that um, the faces of your model, which is going to be made up of polygons, sort of flow over the surface of your mesh. And you want that to look nice, because that means that your model will subdivide well, which means you can make it look all smooth and shiny. It, it will also deform well if you try and animate it. Um, and um, it will also sculpt well when you subdivide it. You won't get crazy looking sort of tearing artifacts and things like that. It's something to pay attention to. Um, there are a few sweeping generalizations we make about what equals good topology. Basically, you don't want triangles if you can avoid them. Obviously, I said for games this doesn't matter, but then for games you're not subdividing a mesh, it's less important. Um, you kind of want to avoid poles. Uh, a pole is where you have a whole bunch of edges on a mesh joining together at one vertex. And if you were to try and subdivide that and bend it slightly, what you get is a whole bunch of little sort of nicks and artifacts around that point because you've got so much geometry trying to connect at one place that that's something to avoid. Um, and in general, you just want your faces to follow the forms of your model. And I'll talk about some of the ways that Blender lets you approach that. So um, as a demo, actually, I was going to load up a little Blend file. And where's my mouse? Hopefully. Show you a bit of animation in Blender. So this is a model that I made a long time ago. And you can see what I mean about good topology is that there are loops that flow around the mouth and the eyes and things like that. And thus, when the face deforms, if you try and close an eye or something like that, it works well because you're just squishing that loop down rather than trying to arrange a whole bunch of different disparate geometry. So it makes your life easier when modeling and animating later on if you try and aim for sort of topology that follows your forms. And that's a sort of highlight of some of the different loops on the face that you should try and pay attention to. Uh, like I say, this is a game model. It looks completely different to the one you just saw. Uh, games, obviously, your model's going to be triangulated. The poly count is going to be much lower. And here, all the detail is added with textures, with things like normal maps and displacement. Uh, this is something Blender can bake. If you have a high poly model, you can bake all the details down using something called a normal map and capture those details and project them onto a very much lower uh, density model, and Blender has tools for that. Uh, these are some still models that I've rendered, just uh, a single frame of, uh, using the Cycles render engine. Uh, you saw that spider at the beginning, and the bottle on the left, um, if you think about how you might make a model of a bottle for a game engine, it'll probably have very, very few faces. It's something you wouldn't see particularly close up, and it's not an important model in your game unless you are making a game about bottles for some reason. Uh, but here, you've got a bottle with thousands of faces in it, and every little drop on the surface of that bottle is more and more faces. Um, if you're making something for a still render, that doesn't matter, because Blender can easily handle that number of polygons. Um, if you're working on something for animation, though, uh, it's kind of an intermediate stage between the two. Your poly count needs to be low enough that that's going to render in a short amount of time, because suddenly you're going from having to create one render from, to having to create 25 for every second of animation that you want. 
And also, your model's probably going to deform. He's probably going to be seen in more than that pose in the course of your little short film or whatever. So you can see that there are loops that run around the arms, around the eyes and the mouth, and that helps him deform well. Then has some pretty good tools for that. So. Um, 3D printing. You can see on this uh, model on the left that I've hollowed it out. Um, I've taken a little cross section here, but then has tools for taking a model and making it, giving its sort of shell a, a thickness so that you can make a model hollow. I've also added a blue uh, support there in the middle just to make sure that the structural integrity of that part that I'm printing stays okay. And you can see on the left there at the top, I've, uh, I've taken a model that has no distinct inside or outside. It's called a non-manifold mesh. Basically, it's anything with a hole in it. Uh, to 3D print something, it needs to be a volume. You need to be able to tell what's the inside of it and the outside. Uh, Bunt has tools for finding uh, holes in meshes and fixing them uh, really quickly and really easily. Um, and this is another bit of 3D printing feedback that Blender will give you. It's, uh, it's a really recent addition and it's very cool. I used it when I was printing that spider. Basically, it's a preview of uh, Blender will show you any areas of your mesh that have different problems. So one is wall thickness, which is what it's displaying there. So it will highlight any areas that have different bits of geometry really close together that might not print out very well. Or if a wall of uh, some part of your model is too thin and won't print well, things like that. Um, Blender will also give you feedback on things like overhang if you're printing on a, maybe a MakerBot printer or something like that. It'll tell you if your uh, model is sort of curving over on itself so that it might fall over while it was printing. Um, so you've got some tools for that. Uh, let's go back to more traditional modeling though. Uh, basically the way that people usually think about modeling is being box versus poly modeling. I'll talk about that. But basically it, you start from a cube and sort of squish it around and add extra geometry to it and try and move it into the shape you want it to be? Or do you start with a single polygon and just make all the bits as you go along, extruding out? And I'll look at those. But Blender has a lot more tools apart from that for modeling available today. Uh, the biggest addition and the one that's had the most features in the past couple of years is sculpting. So now we can start with a really simple base mesh, something that's got very simple topology, a very small poly count, but we can subdivide that a lot and then start sculpting on that in a more traditional way, like it was clay or maybe uh, something real. And you can use brushes for that. You can use uh, a very organic way of sculpting. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, that obviously creates some very high poly meshes. And Blender's got tools that are called retopology tools for taking something that's got a really high poly count, that's got terrible topology, and breaking that down and starting again and building up a mesh around that that has great topology that's got a lower poly count that you can use for animation, for games, for things like that. Um, then it's got some tools for booleans for combining objects together, making them into single meshes. Um, dynamic topology is another sculpting tool that I'll talk about. Uh, and it basically creates geometry on the fly. You don't even need to start with a base mesh. Blender will sort of create new geometry as you sculpt. I'll show you a little demo of that in a bit. Um, and Blender's got parametric procedural modeling tools as well. So um, Blender has a really great modifier system. This has been around for a long time, but it keeps being developed, it keeps getting better. And I'll, uh, I'll cover a bit about that. But it's a basically a way of procedurally taking really simple geometry and doing things to it like mirroring it or duplicating it or creating lots of copies or, or fitting it to the shape of a curve. I'll, uh, I'll look at some ways that Blender has of interacting with models that way. And finally, Blender has a fantastic Python API. If you're a coder, if you're a bit of a hacker, you can, um, you can get access to basically any part of any object in Blender. You can access its material properties, anything, animation properties. Um, but also, you can create models. You can uh, access geometry that already exists. You can create new stuff. Uh, there are great tools for that. And I'll show you a few examples. So um, going back to classic modeling techniques, box versus poly, uh, I said, Box modeling, you start with a cube and you add sort of subdivisions, things like that. You pull it around, push it around. I'll show you a little demo here. This is me doing a little uh, model of a, some strange rock character. I don't know what. But basically, it all starts with a cube. And I'm adding cuts around it here, subdividing it a bit, maybe adding another cube, and just pushing bits of it around. Uh, this is something Blender and any other modeling package has done for a long time. But it's worth just starting with as a starting point uh, here, adding a mirror modifier to make it symmetrical. And that's one way of approaching models. Another is poly modeling. So with poly modeling, you start with a tiny little quad, um, just four vertices, and you fill that out to a, a string of quads and gradually build up the surface you want to make. Here, I'm doing the eye by starting with a little ring. 
and then just pulling out individual polygons as I go along. Uh, there I'm pulling out the eyebrow and just connecting individual faces as I go along. This has some advantages over box modeling in that you're creating the topology exactly as you want it as you go. Uh, box modeling, sometimes you get kind of trapped if you have, you know, you make a cut on one side of your model and that sort of propagates around and wrecks something on the other side. Uh, with poly modeling, you get into that trouble a lot less often. But if you're uh, worrying that all this topology stuff sounds really confusing and it does at first, uh, you don't have to worry about it. You can start with a really simple model and just subdivide it a whole bunch and use Blender sculpting tools instead. These are a, a sort of more traditional art type way of approaching modeling in Blender. And they let you worry about the form of your model first and concentrate on the, the actual underlying geometry later when you're happy with how the model looks already. So um, usually this is done for sort of organic shapes. People sculpt creatures and monsters and just normal people and all sorts of organic looking things. There have been great tools for this for a long time. But recently, uh, there have been some more tools added for doing sort of hard surface shapes, technical things, cars, things like that. Things that have smooth, polished surfaces. There have been more brushes adding to uh, Blender's sculpting system for doing that. So I'll look a bit at those. This is another uh, demo of a bit of sculpting. You can see I'm not having to worry about geometry here at all. In fact, you can't even see the points that make up this mesh. But I'm just working on it with some brushes uh, like it was clay. And uh, this is what's called multi-res sculpting, where you subdivide your model um, like uh, you were adding a, a subdivision surface modifier, which basically just divides every one quad into four, and then four into 16, and 16 into so on. Um, but it means that the original mesh is maintained. So somewhere underneath all that is a really simple, low resolution mesh. And this is called multi-res modeling, or, or sculpting. Uh, for this, you kind of want to start with a model that looks a bit like the final thing you want to make, but it doesn't need to have all the details. Then you add a multi-res modifier on top of that, and you can do some sculpting. Um, because you've already got that low-resolution model that roughly resembles your thing underneath, you can, uh, you can make adjustments to it and keep your details. So I'll show you a bit of an example of that in Blender. So here's a little character. He's uh, actually the one that I will be using in the workshop later today. And I've added a multi-res modifier to him. It's this thing on the right here. And if I subdivide him a couple of times, you can see, if I look at his geometry, he's fairly simple. He's just made up of not that much geometry. But I can subdivide him a few times. And then I can start sculpting on him and adding detail. And I'm doing this on a trackpad. Uh, so this doesn't look that great, but you can see what's happening. And if I can still go back and edit that original low resolution mesh, and I can make changes to it, I can, uh, uh, right, I can try and do that. I can grab a bit, shift it up. And that's propagated to the sculpt without me having to go back and fix a lot of stuff. So it's a really powerful way of keeping your model editable, but also being able to add a lot of detail. Um, So what if you're thinking that still looks way too complex for me? There's another model I made with multi-res sculpting, by the way. You can see on the left is the low-resolution model. And on the right is a, a one that's been sculpted on for some time. But like I say, what if you don't want to do that? What if you just want to start with a cube or a sphere, something that has you know, very little geometry at all? Um, you can do that now thanks to Blender's new dynamic topology features. So this creates new geometry as you go along. Basically, you start with whatever you want. and as you sculpt, Blender will create new geometry. If you try and add detail, it'll subdivide faces to make them smaller and more dense. If you try and pull something out, it'll generate geometry to accommodate that. So I've got a little demo of that as well. You can see this is the same guy as before. And if I were to uh, grab this brush here called the snake hook brush, which uh, grabs basically geometry and pulls it out like a tentacle or something like that, if I do this, on my model without doing anything first. I'm going to run out of geometry capable of supporting that shape really quickly. It looks pretty ugly. Um, however, if I turn on, blend, on uh, dynamic topology and do the same thing, I'm getting new geometry as I go all the time. And I can keep just grabbing bits and pulling them around as I want for as long as I want. And then it's going to keep generating new geometry as I go. Uh, this is destructive. You don't get to go back to the old model 
if I jump into edit mode here, you can see that there's I've been a bunch of really ugly geometry created. So uh, there are drawbacks to this approach, but um, it gives you a lot of flexibility as well, and you don't have to know what you're starting with. So it's really powerful in that respect. Um, so if you made a model that way, there's another look at uh, um, one that's been created with dynamic topology. You can see, you know, there's bits of the face that are really highly subdivided. There's other bits that are fairly coarse. You can imagine that if you were trying to create a rig to maybe animate that, or, or you know, if you wanted to display it in a game engine, you'd have to do some serious work to make that useful. Uh, except that we have Blender's retopology tools, which make it pretty easy. Um, these are ways of taking a model like that that has a high poly count, that has topology that you don't want to work with, and turn it into something simple. Uh, we have Blender snapping and reprojection tools, which um, basically let you draw geometry out on your surface. Start with a plane like you would for poly modeling, but instead of having to place every vertex uh, in complete 3D space exactly where you want it, you can just drag it out over the surface of the model that you've already created, and it'll get projected onto the surface of it. So it makes it really simple to produce models quickly and retopologize things quickly. There's also procedural ways of taking a model like that and making it simpler. There's something called the remesh modifier, which I'll show you a little bit of in a second. And there's some excellent add-ons to Blender that third parties have made for doing retopology quickly as well. There's one called B surfaces, which lets you kind of sketch the geometry you want with pencil strokes. And there's another one called contours, which I'll show you a little demo of that's really cool. Uh, so this is the, the approach that I mentioned first uh, of uh, projection. So I'm starting with one face here on the left, and I'm just extruding little bits of it out and following the shape of my model that I've created by sculpting and uh, basically building out the whole shape. Uh, this is the remesh modifier. So how it works is under the hood, it kind of creates a little Minecraft version of your model. It uh, does a, what's called a marching cubes approximation and basically just figures out on sort of a voxel basis, what's part of your model and what's not. Uh, but then it takes that and takes a mesh uh, created that way, and then it smooths it out and projects it back onto your model. So you can see on the, uh, the right is uh, the model that's been uh, remeshed that way. And although it's not perfect topology, in fact, it's got quite a lot of things that are a little bit ugly, it's an awful lot simpler than the one on the left. Um, and in fact, if you had a really ugly model, it would do a much, much better job. Um, so it's a good starting point for retopology sometimes. Uh, this is the Contours add-on. Uh, it's quite new, and I think it's really cool. Um, this is being developed by the guys at BlenderCookie.com, which you might have heard of. It's a sort of Blender tutorial site, uh, and they're branching out into some development. You can just draw strokes on the surface of your model, and it's uh, then filling out a surface all the way around it. You're not even having to uh, work just from the view that you're in. You can see it's wrapping geometry around that arm as the strokes are being drawn out. And in a second, he's going to apply that, and it gets turned into a mesh. And that was ridiculously quick for something that used to take quite a bit of time. So it's, uh, it's a pretty impressive tool, I think. Um, so those are tools for maybe doing something organic, doing some sculpting, and then doing some retopology to make that into a manageable object. Um, but what if you had some more technical things that you wanted to make? Or you wanted to start with something simple and build that up into something more complex uh, in a sort of procedural way? Well, Blender's modifier stack is a great way of doing that. We've already covered the multi-res modifier that I added to do some sculpting, uh, subdivision, and the remesh modifier, which we had a brief look at as well. Uh, Blender has a whole bunch more modifiers, which are sort of procedural ways of taking a bit of geometry, doing something to it, and giving you the result without losing the original model. Um, the most useful of these probably is the mirror modifier, which uh, works well for things that are pretty much symmetrical, which is most things, uh, chairs, people, tables, anything, cars. Uh, and this lets you just model the half of your model, and then the other half, which is symmetrical, gets generated automatically. I mean, that's been around for a long time, but it's worth knowing about. Uh, the other really powerful thing about the modifiers in Blender is that they can be added together and combined. Uh, Blender has a really powerful modifier stack, which is the way that they're, they're applied. You can reorder the order in which things are done, and that gives you some really powerful results. I'm hopefully going to show you another example of that. So, This is a chain here that I have made using Blender's modifiers. And my screen is a bit the wrong size, but there we go. This is actually made out of some really simple geometry. Uh, it's a chain that follows a curve, and it's made up of a whole bunch of links. But if I slowly take off modifiers, 
you can see that I've used a curve to automatically transform that to the shape that I want to make. Uh, and that's just a modifier that I've applied to the model. Then I've used an array modifier to go from one link to a whole bunch of links, uh, duplicating them automatically. You can see I've just got that tiny one there now. Um, then I've used a subsurf modifier to make it smoother. It's a bit hard to see, I apologize. Um, and then finally, I've uh, got a mirror modifier that takes it from something that's not just symmetrical or one axis, but actually three. Um, so that takes a really tiny bit of geometry and turns it into something you know, quite complex. But the original is still completely editable, which is really powerful. Um, plus, Blender has a whole bunch of other types of object that you can work with. You don't just have to use uh, meshes and polygons like I've been talking about so far. Blender has uh, curve objects, things like called metaballs, which work a bit like um, sort of clay or something. And when they get close to each other, they mesh together. Uh, NURB surfaces, text objects, things like that, uh, all really useful. Uh, there's another example of some modifiers. You can see on the top right there, that's the solidify modifier. It's a really useful one. If you want to 3D print something and you've got a model like the one on the left at the top, which is just like a, a bowl, that's not 3D printable because there's no inside, there's no outside of it. Uh, but the solidify modifier takes that and turns it into a solid surface um, really quickly for you. Uh, another really powerful modifier that uh, I said I'd talk about was the Boolean system. So these are really quick, really easy uh, to create complex shapes by building up combinations of smaller ones, simpler ones. Uh, they do give you some ugly topology, but we've already covered how you can fix that with Blender 3 topology tools. So they're a really powerful tool as well. Uh, finally, let's talk about modeling with code. So there's a whole brilliant backend to Blender which is built on Python that lets you get at anything you want. And people have already built some really great stuff with this. There's a whole bunch of add-on scripts uh, that you can use without having to know any code because people have built user interfaces for them. Things like Sapling and IvyGen, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, add-ons for creating procedural landscapes, uh, terrain, things like that. Be brilliant for use in a game engine. Uh, and also sort of shapes that have really predictable forms, things like gemstones or um, uh, nuts and bolts and cogs and things like that. You can quite often find uh, add-ons for creating those automatically in Blender. Um, and then if you're a coder yourself, you can just get straight into the API, and people have done some fantastic projects with this. I'll, uh, I'll show you a couple of examples in a minute. Uh, so yeah, modeling with code is a great way for approaching models that can be expressed algorithmically. So um, I say, Blender has a great Python API, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sapling is a, an add-on for Blender that creates trees using curves. You basically say, I want a tree that's this high, that has branches from halfway up its uh, height, um, that has this probability of branches, the branches go in this angle, and then it has you know, X leaves per branch. You give it all that info and it spits out a tree. And then you can say, spit me out 50 trees that all look a bit like this, and it'll generate random seeds and create a whole bunch for you. It's really cool. Uh, possibly even cooler, I think, is one called IvyGen. This uh, takes a mesh that you give it. You can give it uh, a building that you've modeled or anything. And it'll grow sort of trailing ivy up the surface of the building. Uh, procedurally, it looks fantastic. It's really cool. Uh, so here's some screenshots of those. On the left is ivy gen. Uh, that's a, you know, just a cube that someone's taken. And they've grown ivy up it with this uh, add-on. And it looks pretty impressive. On the right is just a tree that I quickly generated to show you. Uh, that it also generates leaves as well. So it's a really useful add-on. And it can create some quite realistic looking trees once you take that initial model that it gives you and do a bit to it. Uh, this is a project that a guy called Dolph Wienvliet uh, made. I probably completely ruined his name there, but um, I will apologize for that. Um, he basically uses Blender's Python API to create procedural life forms. Um, the input that he takes is just a piece of text, and then it takes this as the sort of lifeform's DNA and uses that to create a model procedurally uh, using Blender's Python inf interface. And he then 3D prints these and mounts these as sort of zoological specimens for his uh, art project. I think they look really cool, and uh, they're an interesting example of how you can use Blender's Python API to make models. He also applied this to something called the Spaceship Generator. It works in the same way, but some, someone else uh, built a whole library of sort of technical looking spaceship parts and it takes these in, takes a bit of text and creates a new, unique spaceship um, based on that uh, string. It's quite interesting. So uh, in conclusion, there's plenty of ways to create models in Blender. 
And the way you approach making models really depends on what your skills are. Do you want to approach it in a more sort of hacky way? Do you want to do some coding? Or do you want to be more artistic? Do you want to maybe do some sculpting or something like that? Um, and obviously, depending on the outcome you want as well, that's going to affect your modeling strategy. Are you modeling for games? Are you modeling for stills, animation, whatever? So um, the important thing to remember, though, for those approaches is that you know, you're not tied down uh, to one approach. We've got Blender's retopology tools for fixing models, for taking something really high poly, making it simple. Uh, so you're not tied down to any one modeling approach. You can kind of approach things as you like in Blender and some you know, really great tools for that. So thank you very much. This afternoon, we're going to be doing a bit of a workshop. Um, we're going to start with this simple character. I'm going to make him available. And we're hopefully all going to do some you know, sculpting, texturing. I'm going to cover how to approach those. Uh, maybe adding some extra parts to them, and we'll create some, you, you know, some unique versions of this character. Hopefully, everyone will get to, you know, create their own thing. It should be pretty fun. Uh, there's some examples that I made just to sort of test this out. A few different versions. Anyway, um, that's been our talk. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Do we have any questions actually? No. Hi, uh, Hi. I would like to ask uh, if there's any way to fight the crashes when working with uh, Boolean functions. Do you have any tips? Crashes? Yeah. Um, I know the Booleans in Blender used to be a lot worse and they used to be kind of crashy. I do remember that time. They've gotten a lot, lot better recently and they're a lot faster as well. Um, if you have some simple models, they're pretty much like real time. Uh, and you get much better results. I have a little demo file, actually. I can open that up. So one thing uh, you need to remember, uh, when Blender crashes, uh, it, it is constantly uh, saving the autosaves of, of, uh, of your files outside of your project, but onto the root of your hard drive, usually. On, usually in slash TMP folder. folder, there is often uh, a backup of anything that you've been working on. Uh, so often, if it does crash, we've, I don't think I've ever lost anything more than five minutes of work. Uh, if, if, Blender has, if Blender does crash. I didn't know about that. <laughs> it's worth tracking down if you can find it. Um, it's usually named as a number string. Uh, if you can find them, it's usually on a Mac anyway. It's slash TMP. Uh, and if you can find that on your, on your route, uh, you can usually find uh, crash files. So I'm not used to working on a laptop, but this is, uh, this is Blender's Boolean system. You can see I'm combining this, uh, this cylinder here with the model, and it's updating as I, as I move it around. What it's doing is subtracting the cylinder from the, the cube here. If I hide it, you can see it's cut a hole through really cleanly. The topology around it is a bit bad, but you can clean that up pretty easily. So that's, uh, that's Blender's sort of Boolean tools. Any other questions? Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, just wondering, what is your point of view about the the future of Flender uh, with the combination with the 3D printers? I mean, if it's coming through a more domestic layer, more end user, I don't know. <laughs> I mean. Certainly 3D printing looks like it's coming to a more sort of domestic audience. I mean, you've got the MakerBot and things like that now, which are sort of concentrated around a fairly techie crowd. But I think I was reading today about a, uh, um, there's some new 3D printer that's a combination 3D printer and digitizer, like a scanner. So you can just replicate objects. I thought that was really cool. Um, as far as Blender interacting with that goes, we've seen a lot of improvement recently in the number of tools that Blender has for 3D printing. Um, and I can only see that sort of uh, going further. Blender's a great tool for sort of getting into 3D modeling. Um, it's pretty simple. It's not, you know, quite in the sort of SketchUp territory of, you know, instant gratification in terms of being able to model things quickly. But if you've got something a bit more complex, it's one of the best tools out there for, for doing a bit of modeling. So I can only see it being used more for 3D printing. Okay. All right, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.